Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, cold and wet conditions stall planting progress. The global economic ripple effect of the war in Ukraine. Pushing through the pitfalls of urban farming. It's been hot out there. Well, and market analysis days. with Jeff French next. And, uh, I think that drought monitor, you look at I. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow. For over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, April 22 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. Hope springs eternal. This year, the Western Plains, well, they just want some rainfall areas east of the Mississippi River and the southeast are looking for a window of dryness. Field work, let alone planting, has been on a slow pace. Peter Tubbs has more. The nation's corn and soybean crops are off to a rain-delayed start. While the USDA's crop progress report shows corn and soybeans only a few percentage points off the five-year average pace, Another wet week in the upper Midwest will push the start of planting close to early May. Planting progress stands at zero in Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Minnesota, which combined represent 51% of the corn and 47% of the soybean crops annually. Delayed producers are finding their patience beginning to be tested. A week ago, I'd say it was kind of jokingly to, to hear more recently, guys are getting pretty frustrated. They're getting antsy. They, they want to get a crop in the, the field, but with the way the markets are right now, they don't dare take a risk on, on putting a crop in the field and having to do it twice. So a lot of them are holding out, but a few are, are going and going ahead and getting a start on it. Patience wins. Patience brings yield. So take your time. So we all worry about whether we're doing the right thing or not, or whether we got them in the right time. But with the temperatures the way they are right now, and I, we do furrow depth and we also do four inch depth and we check it ourselves, I just don't feel comfortable putting my expensive seed in the ground right now. Snow was a major barrier in North Dakota last week with several feet of snow and more in the forecast this weekend. We, we had the drill hooked up and ready to start seeding the day before this blizzard hit. So the ground temps were above 40 degrees. The, the soil was dry. Planning conditions would have been, you know, close to ideal. Um, and we just decided, well, with this big blizzard come in, we'll, we'll wait. And uh, so I think just that wrapping around that mentally is that, okay, we're ready to go seeding. And now, you you know, four days later, when you look outside, it's, uh, well, it's going to be a few weeks. Despite the current wet conditions, crops in the western half of the U.S. will be planted into drought conditions. The National Weather Service's Climate Prediction Center sees drought continuing for much of the country and worsening in the western Corn Belt. From Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. New home builders keep hammering away at demand. The Commerce Department revealed a three-tenths of a percent gain last month in new housing starts. This is the highest annual rate of building since June of 2006. A rise in mortgage rates slowed the pace of existing home sales in March. Record high prices also contributed to the 2.7% drop. The Rural Main Street Index reported a reading above growth neutral for the 17th straight month. However, the rate did drop more than three points to a reading of 62. CoBank's Knowledge Exchange predicts Russia's invasion of Ukraine will not only impact this year's trade in soybeans, corn and wheat, but will add to volatility for the next two to three years with disruptions in planting, harvesting and exporting grain. CoBank isn't alone in their assessment as major players in the banking system release their annual reports. Josh Bittner has more. 
This week, global financial authorities downgraded their outlook for the world economy through 2022 and 2023. A domino effect of high energy prices and food shortages tied to Russia's war in Ukraine and the lingering threat of new coronavirus variants. The latest lockdowns in China could cause new bottlenecks in supply chains. In this context, beyond its immediate and tragic humanitarian impact, the war will slow economic growth and increase inflation. As the United Nations reports, over 5 million refugees have now fled Ukraine. Russia's invasion and subsequent humanitarian crisis have helped sink global growth estimates well below a 6% expansion in 2021. The International Monetary Fund forecasts Russia's sanction-battered economy will shrink 8.5% this year, while Ukraine's will plummet by 35%. We are downgrading 143 countries. This is 86% of global GDP. IMF officials say Europe, heavily dependent on Russian energy, will bear the brunt of economic fallout, with collective growth at just 2.8% this year. China is set to drop to 4.4% in 2022, with the U.S. down to 3.7%, where inflation is running at a four-decade high. Poor people depend on coming here. Like, it's something we need every single week. While the risk of extreme poverty exists for tens of millions in nations dependent on Black Sea exports, particularly Russian fertilizer, pundits warn developed nations will feel the strain. Consumer prices are expected to jump nearly 6% over the next 12 months. The number of people facing food insecurity has increased over the last year, especially after the pandemic, to over, I think it's over 800 million people. The World Bank announced their largest set of commitments ever to the planet's poorest nations with a 15-month, $170 billion response package. The fertilizer and energy are critical for the crop cycle, so they're building on each other and creating a uh, food insecurity crisis that uh, will last at least months and probably into next year. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. The end of 2021 brought another record for selling farmland. Once $22,000 was breached, sales progressed higher before topping out at $26,000 per acre. Now, finding farmland to buy is a challenge, and so is purchasing lots in town. A hot housing market has again made development opportunities elusive. Abandoned urban lots serve as an opportunity, including the chance to turn some tracks into places for growing food inside the city limits. Josh Bittner reports in our cover story. Monica of Charsky cultivates her inner city community from the ground up through urban farming. Where we're standing was a redlined neighborhood. After moving into a historically underprivileged location near downtown Des Moines, Iowa, the young wife and mother also started the city's first community fridge and pantry, kept afloat by volunteers who share her commitment to eradicate food insecurity. The main difference between urban farming and gardening are probably scale, succession, and selling. The former social worker says fresh, chemical-free produce should never be considered a luxury item. Her Sweet Tooth Farm accepts food stamps and other assistance, shares farm implements with neighbors, and operates primarily right next door. When we moved here, this was Royal Park. The Parks Department actually still owns this space. We are stewards of this lot. Her push to convert the rundown spot to small-scale agricultural use impressed the city's director of Parks and Recreation, Ben Page, who says it's a first in his department's 125-year history. She's helped so many people. And I think it wouldn't be a surprise if I tell you Des Moines is not a wealthy city. I mean, we talk about 80-plus percent of our kids on free and reduced lunch. Another goal of the city was to find ways to stop these food deserts and to help people find local produce and healthy food. And you point to this as probably one of the successful things we started that movement with, which Monica. Despite local accolades, Ofcharsky's plan to expand from one to three acres was nipped in the bud this summer when another city division informed her they would not renew leases on two other parcels of industrial land she'd acquired, both unused since the 1970s. It's quite a precarious position to be in. The explanation that we were given was that the city of Des Moines just doesn't have enough undeveloped land available for people. 
So they want to have it ready in case someone ever wanted to build on it. In a June email to the mayor and city council, Des Moines Director of Development Services stated efforts to redevelop, expand the city's tax base and employment opportunities were behind the decision, reiterating such properties are intended for development purposes in the long term. Ofcharsky says officials offered up another piece of land, but she found it inadequate for various reasons. This might sound um, forward or blunt, but it is very easy to make a graphic or a hashtag about supporting local farms or shop local or even about healthy eating. It's much more difficult to put your money where your mouth is and make decisions that potentially are not as lucrative financially for the city, but could be exponentially better for the community in real terms. While her initial model is rather unique to the area, nationwide, many urban gardeners have run afoul of what they call myriad hazy provisions as local governments adapt. When we talk about the laws and the policies that impact how we produce our food, who produces our food, uh, urban agriculture is definitely a growing part of that discussion. Jennifer Zwagerman is the director of Drake University's Agricultural Law Center in Des Moines. In addition to educating the next generation of attorneys, Drake publishes research and information on issues impacting food and farm production. Zoning is probably the biggest thing. And you know, you're also gonna need to look at tax issues. You're gonna need to look at uh, business issues. You know, how are you planning to operate? What changes if you plan to expand? Just a few miles away lies a pocket of unincorporated county land and another neighborhood farm. Dog Patch Urban Gardens, which also felt blindsided by bureaucracy in the recent past. Frankly, the hardships we faced, we almost just shut down the business. Former high school science teacher Jenny Quiner now sells fresh organic produce to restaurants, grocers, and at her farm stand. She says though diligent and proactive about local regulations, two years after startup, she faced around $75,000 in commercial storefront compliance requirements when Polk County officials updated her assessment. Initially, we were deemed a farm stand, which kind of checked the boxes. The two restrooms. My gut says the county probably thought that this will be a small thing that, you know, will just kind of float. But we ended up being more successful in getting a lot of people through the door, which then got more eyes on our business. Ultimately, Quiner was able to rally with community donations covering a portion of the funds via a wildly successful online fundraiser. That really was an uplifting experience. In a statement, the Polk County Board of Supervisors commended local food producers, particularly during the pandemic, and said they're open to discussing unnecessary barriers to entry while maintaining fair rules to protect resident health and safety. The problem we dealt with was when we asked initially if we needed these things, we were told no. Quiner says those following in her footsteps should exhaust all legal advice before breaking ground. Efforts in recent years by Iowa's General Assembly to address urban farm zoning issues may have lost steam, but cities coast to coast have turned urban decay into bountiful harvests with support from federal grants through USDA. Others counter land issues which can be micromanaged at the homeowner association level are best dealt with locally. The cities that have really worked to encourage this type of, of activity, they set clear definitions for what they expect. What's an urban garden versus a commercial enterprise? They're going to define that so that when you're thinking about entering this market or becoming part of this movement, you know what it is that you need to do. In the meantime, Ovcharsky is faced with a setback in production and may have no way to recoup the $10,000 she spent rehabbing the soil on lots the city is reclaiming. But she says she'll make it through with support from friends and neighbors. She plans to do her best avoiding similar issues in the search for new properties, but offers a word of caution. Unfortunately, bureaucracy moves a lot slower than the growing season. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. Next, the Market to Market Report. Global events and actions had a mixed impact on the trade for the week. The nearby wheat contract lost 31 cents, while May corn added 3 cents. Chinese buying carried the most weight in the soy complex. The May soybean contract gained 34 cents. May meal dropped by 260 per ton.
July cotton, that fell 46 per hundred weight. In the dairy parlor, March class, or that's May class three milk shed 77 cents, the livestock sector. That was up. June cattle expanded $2. May feeders increased to 10. And the June lean hog contract added 30 cents. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index rallied 84 ticks. June crude oil declined 4.48 per barrel. Comex Gold fell 38.90 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index shed more than 16 points to finish at 7.48.10. Joining us now to provide some insight is Jeff French. Jeff, good to have you back. Great to be here, Paul. This wheat thing, uh, and you saw in the stories, we talked to a couple of corn farmers and a North Dakota producer. The wheat has been elusive for moisture and to get into the ground. Have we switched? And then this Russia news of they're going to start exporting again. Are those two the biggest drivers in the direction we're going with wheat right now? Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's the export market of the Russia. Uh, story out here uh, this week that, you know, they exported 30 million metric tons. And uh, they're saying that they could export this year up to 40 million metric tons, which is a huge amount. Um, you know, we'll see if they're able to skirt those sanctions. I think they'll do everything. A lot they of can. unknown destinations yes. or origins of these tankers, yeah, right? Yeah, black market type deals. So, and then the crop ratings, you know, they went down this week. Uh, you know, I would have liked to see the wheat perform better. It was an outside down day, uh, weekly close, uh, technically pretty negative. And you look at those new crop prices hovering right around $12. We tried multiple times to get through that. Uh, and we weren't able to, and uh, it sold off here. I mean, it's just, you know, looking at the conditions, it, it's hard to be a seller here with what, you know, how many bushels am I actually going to produce? Uh, so I would go on paper here, get some futures sold, or get some puts bought, because the wheat looks like it's got lower prices coming. And do you add in one more wrinkle with the Russians, this whole we're tying the ruble to gold, and they're trying to change some of the they're trying to get around sanctions themselves. Is that at play at any of this global story? Oh, absolutely, because the, the global demand uh, is going to be there, and, and I don't see that going away here in the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, so the wheat will find its way uh, to the willing buy buyers, and there will be countries that will be willing to buy the Russian wheat. We had a holiday over the weekend, Easter. We're looking at another holiday, Mother's Day, before we get too excited about corn planting. Let's start with the old crop, then we'll get to the Mother's Day anecdote. Uh, do you believe that the rally, that's the big question, is it done in corn in that old crop for now? Uh, I, I think we need to see maybe another week. Uh, you know, we had $8 corn this week. We had five days of $8 corn. Uh, since the Board of Trade has been around since 1848, there has been 37 days with corn above $8 a bushel. Five of those days were this week. So uh, we are in rare times, rare, rare prices here. Uh, if you have some bushels left to sell, take advantage of it. These are phenomenal prices. Do you think people really do have corn left? Yeah, I do, I do, I think they do. And uh, you see that in the basis. I mean, some of the basis has weakened up here on this rally. Um, but yeah, I talked to producers that have old crop corn left right now. Well, let's just do it now. Let's, uh, we're going to switch things up a little bit. Tim in Houston, Minnesota actually has a question about basis. He's asking us on Twitter, what are your thoughts on basis, both old and new crops? Let's just stick with corn. Uh, old crop, historically very tight here right now. Many places uh, throughout the country are positive basis. Uh, again, it's weakened up here a little bit uh, on this rally, uh, but I have no problem uh, locking in the old crop. Uh, new crop, you know, uh, you'll have to look at your local area. Uh, you, you know that better than anybody. Uh, but historically, basis, if you look at the la last five years, it's very strong still. You mentioned the new crop. Uh, I mentioned Mother's Day. Are you in that camp of, I'm not too worried about spring planting progress until Mother's Day? You know, I, I look at it, you know, from a national standpoint. I, I think you get to... You know, you look at the last 10 years, and uh, by May 8th, nationally, uh, if we don't have 50% of the corn planted, uh, then we are delayed. Um, does that bring down the bushels in the final yield? You know, we'll have to see what the summer uh, entails weather-wise. Uh, but I, I look at that May 8th. we got to get it in, you know, 50% in the ground by then on the corn. Do you put in volatility as the most in play in those next two weeks for the, new crop? 
the, the Monday crop progress reports here in the next three to four weeks are going to be very closely watched. And, and that Monday night grain trade is going to be volatile. I mean, it, it's volatile already. I mean, with prices like this, you are going to have uh, big price moves, and we've seen that here recently. Uh, but volatility is, is going to be here to stay here for a while in the grain markets. In beans, uh, beans were kind of opposite corn and wheat until today. What changed? Well, I think this, you know, the, the big story here recently has been, it's been about the edible oils and it's been about the bean oil rally. And it rallied this week to new all time high prices, 83, 84 cents a pound. Uh, and then overnight, Indonesia came out and says, well, we are banning exports on their palm oil. Well, Indonesia is the biggest exporter of edible oils in the world. And then you have the problems of going in Ukraine with sunseed. Ukraine sells a ton of uh, sun oil on the world export market. So you're taking about 20% of the world exporters out of the market. So you had this market go straight up. It rallied the beans with it. But Friday's close in the beans was not good at all. The resistance was there at 16. It just couldn't get. So is this a technical move too? It could have been pro profit taken. You see that after, you know, we rallied this thing here in the last three weeks, about $1.70 a bushel. Uh, I didn't like the fact that it didn't take out the contract highs. We got within, you know, five, six, seven cents, and then we failed. Was it profit taking? Uh, we'll have to see next week, but uh, definitely not a good way to close out Friday. If we have weakness next week, I think these beans are coming under pressure here. I mean, you look at it, they're $15 beans, 92 million acres gonna go in the ground, you know, with normal growing conditions. I know that's a big if, we'll have to see what happens, but uh, $15 off the combine sounds very good to me. Uh, what percentage should maybe somebody think about selling? Oh, I, I think 25, 30%. I have no crop. problem with that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's phenomenal prices. Let's move to the livestock. We had a cattle on feed report today. Uh, if you're playing darts, I don't think you want to look where your dart landed. No, it was a big miss. Uh, the, the one that stands out is the placements. Came in at 100% of last year. Uh, you know, the analysts thought it was only going to be down at 92%, and actually a lot of the range was below that, down at 87%. So big miss on there. Um, also, the on feed numbers, 2% higher than last year. Uh, we thought we were going to get to an area where we start to work through these animals, uh, but we're going to have some numbers to deal with here through August. Um, you know, we got that August in that 140, 142 area. These cattle need to be protected here. Well, after the last cattle and feed report, we had major rally in feeders, if I remember correctly. Do you expect that action to take place on Monday? No, I don't. Okay. Uh, I, I think uh, I think the cattle complex initially will be under pressure, uh, and. and you know, that's the way we rallied. We rallied strong into this. I mean, the fats have been up six, seven, eight dollars here in the last two weeks. Um, I, I think we'll be under pressure Monday. It will be important how we close the day out. You concerned about the uh, slaughter pace in the live cattle? No, slaughter numbers are good. I mean, we're staying current, especially with the more number of cattle on feed. Um, also, you look at cow slaughter. I mean, cow slaughter is running uh, drastically. Uh, above last year levels. And we are on pace to cull 7 million cows. Uh, that's the most since 1996. So this herd is getting smaller and that's gonna con con continue here. Um, and fundamentally, it's gonna be bullish longer term, but right now we have some numbers to work through. All right, in the hog market, it looked like maybe some bottom feeders were coming in. I mean, the, the, the early in the week, we only finished the week up a couple of cents. Does that signal something to you? No, I, I like the hogs here. I, I mean, I, I think if, if one sector of it, I, I think the hogs here, we're not expanding anywhere. China's not expanding. The European Union's not expanding. We're not expanding here. Uh, numbers are tight. Kills are huge. Uh, product is going up. And I see good, better demand here moving forward. Uh, you know, we, we were in the 130s last year uh, in the summer contracts. I, I see no reason that we can't be there here this summer in our summer contracts for 2022. Of the three meats that we talk about regularly here, which one of the those contract, wh which one of those sectors do you, has the most upside? As of right now, it would be the hog market. Okay. All right. Uh, I want to before we close, I need to ask you about crude. Uh, last week we fought off right there at 100. Right before uh, this week we finished off four percent, but still above 100. What does that mean? It's been choppy for a month straight. You know, I, I we talked crude here with a couple of clients today. I mean. 
I, I'll sell crude below 97 and I'll buy it above 113. I, I mean, really, we haven't done much in, in the last six weeks in the crude market. You don't see any of the expansion that's maybe coming on in Texas or what they continue to produce in North Dakota or any other of these patches that are coming back online is significant? Uh, not in the next 60 to 90 days. I think maybe after that. But right now for today's spot market, uh, I don't think that has a bearing right now. Natural gas was off. Fertilizer, we're losing some here, are we? Yeah, the natural gas, I mean, it traded up to a 10-year high this week, got, you know, right up of $8 a therm, uh, then broke hard. I, I mean, again, we'll have to see. The fertilizer thing is not going away. And How about we talk about that in Market Plus? <laughs> All right, I, I won't hang out next time in Plus. We have more time. <laughs> All, right. All right, thanks, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> that will do it for the installment of Market to Market. We're going to keep going in Market Plus. As I just mentioned, we'll talk about natural gas and your questions. You can find that free on our website of markettomarket.org. Now, Facebook may feature some strong opinions, but we do try to bring solid content with pictures and stories from our work that we do here. Follow our efforts at Market to Market Show. Next week, we look at the roller coaster ride for dry beans and other pulse crops. Thank you for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.